Have you ever fought devils before? Anybody? Anybody ever fought devils before? Yeah? What was that like? They don't, they're not nice, are they? Think of, um, and I, I really think this is a good analogy. You know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos on animals, animal behavior, human behavior, stuff like that. And I was watching bees and wasps yesterday and think of bees wasps hornets there is a Japanese hornet that's that big and they are monsters and Japan can keep them as far as I'm concerned uh, killer bees I used to be you know, back in the 70s, they made these killer bee movies. You remember those? And they were talking about how they were coming up from Mexico into Texas. And that by such and such year, they will have invaded. I was scared to death as a boy. Thinking that we were going to be invaded by these Africanized killer bees. And everybody was going to die. Scared to death. Well, with bees... They have, if you find, uh, what is it, a yellow jacket's nest down in the ground. The guy showed, I was watching a video, and you may not be able to see them, but just barely down in that hole are sentry bees. S-E-N-T-R-Y. They're sentries. They're standing there guarding the hole. And if they think that something is about to invade, those sentries will come out and go nuts on whatever is around there. If you've ever been mowing your grass, tell me the story, JR. Yeah, you ran over one of their little nests in the ground, didn't you? Oh my goodness, it hurts about that bad, doesn't it? Um, Steve told me a story where he lived one time. He, he had these yellow jackets coming up out of the ground. And I discovered this on my own, but gasoline and bees and wasps and things like that, you hit them with gas, they're instantly dead. So his thinking was, pour gas down in that hole and kill them. Well, they kept coming out. So he kept pouring gas down in that hole. And they kept coming out. He kept pouring gas down in that hole. Finally, he said, I've had enough of this. And made him a little trail in the grass and lit it. Well, boom! The neighbors came out <laughs> to see where the, excite, the, the explosion was going on. So he didn't do that again. I was painting at Mill Creek, Randy Mills, and was spraying... We had to spray on the outside an uh, oil-based paint and then second coat it with a latex. So I'm out there spraying paint on the siding of this house and these things are coming up right where my ladder is. The only thing I had in my hand was this spray wand and I just went like that and little droplets of oil paint on their wings, they just go brrrr. I spent 30 minutes just having fun watching them things going brrrr. Listen, then I won't live. You won't find me on a telephone pole opening up nothing. That's not how it's going to happen with me. I said all that to say this. Devils are beasts, and God has given beasts a sense to know when danger is present. Bees... When you will, bees will know you are there before you know you're there. And when they feel or see a threat, they will launch an attack. So I want you to keep this in mind. You are saved. You are born again. The spirit of the living God sits on the throne of your heart. And there's not room 
for a devil to sit on that throne. Kenneth Copeland and these guys, they say that Christians can be possessed of devils. That's why you got sick, bless God. You got a devil in you. That is not, that's a lie. When you've got God reigning in your heart, he does not allow a devil to sit on that throne. But they will oppress you. They will attack you because they, devils know who Jesus is. When they sense Jesus and his presence in your life, they will get mean. They will attack, they will threaten, but they can never do anything unless God allows them to do it. Very, very important. Let's go to Revelation 12. So keep living for the Lord. Because if devils leave you alone, there's something wrong. If devils don't bother you, there's something wrong with you and your life with Jesus. Because they hate him. Revelation 12, verse 7. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. So those are the devils. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, that you guide and bless uh, our study tonight. Fill us full of wisdom. Father, this Bible is written to us uh, in this situation for us to be able to see what our eyes cannot see going on around us. I believe this book is right. I believe Satan has his angels. And those evil angels create a lot of problems here on this earth. We are at war with them. They fight a war in heaven. They're not going to win. They get cast out to the earth. They're going to fight a battle on the earth and they're still not going to win. Father, help us keep that in mind. The devil's not going to win anything that you don't let him win. And Lord, just give us encouragement, give us strength, give us wisdom. Help us, Father, to deal with the devils that we fight every day. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All the God's people said, Amen. Amen. So Matthew chapter 25, turn there. Uh, Revelation 12 makes it very, very clear. There are two groups of angels. There is a group of angels. Michael is their archangel. He is their captain. He is the general of the army. He says, let's fight, then they fight. Um, he leads two-thirds of the angelic realm in a war against Satan and one-third of the angelic realm. And there's an interesting story in the Old Testament. I just, this came to mind while I was reading this and while I was praying. The devil is fighting a war in heaven and he's not going to win. So he's going to be kicked out, and then he's going to fight a war on the earth thinking he can win, and he's not going to win. That's the battle of Armageddon. There's a man by the, in the Bible by the name of Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad had 32 kings on his side. 32 plus 1 is what? 33. And a third as a percentage is what? 33. So you have a story there. And the story is Ben-Hadad and his kings decide... To try to conquer Israel. And they pick a, a hill or a mountain. A high place to fight the battle on. And God gives Israel the victory. But the 33 kings get to escape. So they get back. And they get drunk. And they decide well their gods are the gods of the mountains. So if we fight them in the valley. I don't think they have gods in the valley. So they'll probably lose. So they decide to go to war now. Instead of going to war on the mountain, they go to war in a low place and they get beat again. And what that is, is a picture of, think of, where was Christ crucified? On a hill, on a mountain, on a high place. They tried to beat him there and it didn't work. That's where that song, God of the Mountain, comes from. He's the God on the mountain. You know that song? 
and the God of the valley. So Satan tries to defeat Christ on Calvary, loses. Satan tries to defeat God in heaven in a high place and loses. So he's cast down to the earth and he starts gathering armies because he's going to try to fight Jesus and all of us with him in the valley of what? Armageddon, the low place. Thinking that Jesus won't have any power there to beat him. He's a beast. He's not, he's very intelligent, but he's limited in his foresight. Limited by his nature. He does not understand certain things. So he thinks that he can beat Jesus and his army down in the valley of Armageddon. And it's not even a contest. They're just slain and bodies laying everywhere. And the beast and the false prophet are cast into the, to the bottomless pit. And then Satan is taken and cast there. I think the beast and false prophet are thrown in the lake of fire. But anyway, there's that story of these angels... And where they're choosing to fight, they're going to lose every fight and every battle. You take that with home with you tonight. Amen. Now, Matthew 25, verse 40. The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least one of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And he's talking about the separation of the sheep and the goats. Now, verse 41 we find that hell was created for devils. Because it says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So I'm, I said hell, but I think it's more the lake of fire. All of the angels... The evil angels, the devils, and Satan himself, God created the lake of fire specifically for them. But, after Adam's transgression in the garden, after Eve's transgression in the garden, hell hath enlarged herself. Because in the same place that God is going to put the devil and his angels... God is going to judge mankind and when he finds them guilty of being wicked and without faith, he will cast them into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Verse uh, 42, for I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. And I was stranger and you took me not in, naked and you clothed me not, sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then shall also, then shall they also answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered or a thirst or a stranger? or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Verse 46, These shall go away into everlasting, what? Punishment. But the righteous into life eternal. So that is one of the verses we used when we were talking and teaching about hell. And the lake of fire is that it is not annihilation. It is everlasting torment and everlasting punishment. But it was originally made for the devil and his angels. They are going to be cast there. And there's God does not offer angels redemption. He does not give them the choice to be saved. They're just made to be taken and destroyed. They're beasts. And that's what God's going to do to them. In Matthew chapter 4, let's look a little bit in the Gospels about the issue of possession. Can a person be possessed of a devil? Let me first ask you, have you ever encountered someone that you either suspected or you knew that they were possessed or inhabited by a devil. You have. Do what? Really? Okay. I believe you. I believe you. Anybody else? I have not. I don't know why I haven't. I may have suspected that somebody 
had a devil in them or had a spirit in them. But as far as me talking to someone and all of a sudden a voice comes out that I know is not them, I've never had that encounter. Uh, I will tell you that um, when we used to go to the Missouri Bible camp, uh, they had me preaching one year. And God was really doing some good things that year. And it came to the last service. And I prayed all day about that sermon. God, show me what you want me to preach. Tell me, tell, these kids are going to leave and go back home. Tell me what you're going to send with them. And God gave me a message on preaching about the book, the Bible. And just as we were about ready to get the service started, they said... We need to stop. I noticed that some of the adults were walking up down the aisles. And I knew something was wrong. And I finally said, what's going on? They said, we're missing a child. Before, right before that service, a woman pulled up with her girlfriend. Now, I knew this woman. She used to teach here. Her husband was a free will Baptist pastor. And she decided that being queer was how she wanted to live her life. So she divorced him and her and this other woman moved in together. And her kids were at that camp that week. And the camp was going great until she pulled up. And I knew her and I knew what she was and I knew what kind of spirit she had with her. And the, from the moment she stepped into that camp, there was absolute confusion and chaos. And it took them over an hour to where they finally found this girl hiding in a closet in the cabin that she had been in. And by this time, the service would have been over. And people are asking me, what are we going to do? Are we going to have the service or, you know, this? We don't know what to do. They were asking me, are you going to preach? I said, I don't know. I mean, it was just chaos everywhere. And I had a young lady come up to me. And she, tears in her eyes. And she said, Brother Mike, are you going to preach tonight? And I said, do you want me to? She said, yes, please. I said, it's on then. And I preached my guts out that night. And a pastor friend that I've known him for years. We're not close friends, but I knew him. And I knew that he really leaned toward the liberal side. And I preached about this book, the Bible. And he was down at the altar that night. And he came up to me afterward and he said, thank you. He said, you have restored my confidence in the Bible. And it was one of those situations where I knew a person was there. And I knew that a spirit inhabited them or was part of their life and when she showed up chaos everywhere and God had to put all that thing back together and God finally got the victory but there are people in America because of our culture and our background we tend not to uh, think in terms of someone being possessed of a devil so I think in America, it's more subtle and hidden than if you were to go to third world countries where voodoo and all kinds of witchcraft have existed for thousands of years. And there are people there who act in the most wild, beastly, devilish ways. And you would say, they got a devil in them. There's no doubt in my mind about it. But I think in America, people have devils and they're possessed of them, but it's very subtle. And they're, they're doing something, they're building up to something. So, Matthew chapter 4, let's look at the issue of possession by devils. Matthew 4, 24, and his fame went through all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and then, and those which were possessed with devils. Those which were lunatic. What does that word mean? Lunatic. Lunatic, what does it mean? How crazy. We say, well, he's a lunatic. He's crazy. And it actually comes from the word lunar is in that word. Luna means moon. And uh, in Spanish, I think Monday is, 
Huh? Moon day, but it's, in Spanish, it's lunas. All right? That's what little Spanish I know. Um, but anyway, the idea that some people act in a wild manner when the moon is full goes back thousands of years. People have believed that forever. And here, the language of the Bible seems to indicate the presence of a spirit in someone who is a lunatic. Let me show you where I'm thinking here. Turn to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. I'm not, and what I'm saying now, I do not know 100% for sure. So, you can disagree with me or say, Hoggard, move on. You don't know what you're talking about. And I'm fine with that. But I, here's my theory. On day 4, verse 14, Genesis 1, 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let, there be, let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and then what? The lesser light to rule the night. That's the moon. The moon is the lesser light that rules over the night. Now, turn to 1 Thessalonians. Well, I've got you moving, don't I? 1 Thessalonians 5. I believe that there is a spirit associated with ruling over darkness. Think of what we're wrestling against. Principalities, powers, and then what? Rulers of the darkness of this world. So Paul in Ephesians 6 is actually telling us that these night lights are representative of spirits. So in my thinking, a lunatic is someone who has or is being ruled over by a spirit of darkness, a um, rulers of the darkness of this world. Does that make sense to you? In other words, w when I see a word like this somewhere else, I know that they're saying in a roundabout way, this person's crazy, he's a lunatic. When I see it in the Bible, I don't think it's just there to fill up space. I think the word means or is related to the lesser light that rules over the darkness. So 1 Thessalonians 5, let's look at verse 4. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of what? The light. So we are the children of the greater light that rules over the day. The Bible calls Jesus that light, the Son, capital S, U-N, of righteousness. So the Son is a representation of Jesus Christ. He rules over the light, and we are His people. The darkness, there is a lesser light that rules over the darkness. We are not in that darkness. We're children of the day. Ye are all children, verse 5, ye are children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That means a right mind. Contrast that with those which were lunatic. Okay? I see, I see a connection here. Uh, we are not of the night nor of darkness, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, they that be drunken are drunken in the night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on, now watch this, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now Paul is attaching this to Ephesians 6, where he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness, therefore put on the whole armor of God. So I think he's connecting it with Ephesians 6. And I think all of this, understanding the nature of the, of the lights that we have in our sky, 
God in His Word is attaching sunlight, brightness, daytime, things like that with Christ and His people and associating darkness, the rulers of that darkness being the moon and the stars. And in Revelation 12, those angels that fell were called stars. Stars of heaven. One third of them cast down to the earth. So the moon, I think, would be a representation of Satan, the lesser light that rules over the darkness. Okay? That's my thoughts on it. I've not written a dogmatic doctrine on this, but to me it makes sense. Um, some of the things that I know about the human body, I got from a ER doctor by the name of Chuck Thurston. I got acquainted with him through Southwest Radio. He and I will call every now and then, share some things with each other. He is an ER doctor, which means he's very smart and he's very quick on his feet. When you're an ER doctor, you have to make very rapid decisions in order to save somebody's life. And Chuck has told me that he can usually spot someone who is acting in a certain way and he knows he doesn't think they're on drugs. He doesn't think it's alcohol doing it. And he has said to people in the ER, I don't know whatever your name is, Spirit, but in the name of Jesus, sit down and be quiet or I'm going to throw you out of here. He's done things like that. Had to. I can't disagree with him. I've never encountered that. I think I would probably die right then and there. It would scare me to death. But some people are cut out for that, and he is. And I believe when he tells me that he's encountered people with spirits, he wasn't kidding. And I think the word lunatic in the Bible portrays that. It's not just a psychopathic thing going on in their mind. There's a spirit that's ruling them. All right? And those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. He cast them out. Turn to Matthew chapter 8. Now I want you to look up on the screen. There's two stories. Gadarenes or Gergesenes. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's two stories in the Bible. Some of the Bible scholars say, obviously it's the same story, but one of the writers got it wrong. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't. Look at these two stories and say one of them's wrong because this is the word of God. Rule number one is there's no mistakes in my Bible. Rule number two, if somebody says, well, that's a mistake, I go back to rule number one and say it can't be. So then we have to decide, are we talking about the same thing or is it two different stories? Let me show you what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And when he has come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils now in mark 5 he goes to the country of the gadarenes and encounters one man possessed with devils so this is this again the people who don't believe the bible is perfect automatically say obviously this is a mistake somebody copying the story got it wrong but it ended up in our bible so there's mistakes in the Bibles. I can't believe that. I won't believe it. Doesn't help me to believe there are mistakes in the Bible. So I think this is a different story, even though it is similar. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a problem in life, gone through it, and then we're talking with somebody, and all of a sudden you found out that they had almost the exact same thing happen to them, Almost to the detail. Has that ever happened to you? Of course. There's no tempta temptation, but such as is common to man. So there are going to be instances where people who are in different places, different times, will have almost the identical issue going on in their life. So, we have two men possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And this is a true story. There were two men possessed with devils. 
They were crazy. They were lunatics. And whenever people would pass by that way, those men would come out of that cave. Now, I'm not, I don't know what it says that they would do to them, but n people just decided we're not going that way ever again. So verse 29, Behold, they cried out saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Mark this down. The devils know who Jesus is. How do they know? They have access to heaven. And he was up there. Standing at the right hand of God. They know who Jesus is. But. That doesn't mean. That they're going to tell the truth of what they know. They're going to lie about it. Jesus? He's not the son of God. And yet here, you can just see him shaking. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus, son of the most high God? Uh, verse 30. And there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Good for the pigs. And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. My goodness. A whole town, after seeing a miracle take place, here's these two men whose lives were destroyed by these devils. Jesus cast the devils out. Now these two men have been set free. And now these people are free to go on the old path that they used to walk on. But as soon as they meet Jesus, they say, you need to leave our town. Don't you ever come back here again. And I think Jesus probably never went back there ever again. And the sad to say is some people, even when they see the work of God, they will reject God and say, I want nothing to do with you. I don't understand that, but that's what people do. But these men were obviously inhabited by spirits. Turn to Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That spirit works in, in everybody in the world that's lost. Um, in talking to Pastor Rock from India, he says that oftentimes he has to deal with groups of people who come to his church to attack, to cause them to quit having church. And these people are religious people. They are Sikhs. They are Hindus. Believing in Shiva and 33 million gods. Guess what my theory is? When they worship 33 million gods, I think they're worshiping the devils who are 33% of the group of total of angels. Just that number. I asked pastor, I said, pastor, is it true that they believe in 33 million gods? And he said, oh yeah. And I told him what I thought. He went, I agree. Because these gods that they're worshiping are these evil angels. And these gods commanded these people to come and attack Pastor Rock at his church. Now these Hindus, they say that they're peaceful people and just want to coexist with everybody and everybody live in harmony. But see, there's a man with a Bible in their town. And the devils that are in those people hate, they don't hate that Bible, they're afraid of that Bible. 
Because that Bible's got power. What did these devils, when they first saw Jesus, what was their reaction? What are we to do with thee? They were angry and they were frightened. Okay? So here's Pastor Rock. He's preaching out of a King James Bible. He has the word of God and the presence of Jesus with him. And those men came out of the woodwork to attack his church. Okay? Pray for us because we're thinking about going there for a couple days preaching, okay? I don't want to get killed. But what makes these men do that? It's the devils in them commanding them, okay? You're going to meet or have met people that instantaneously there's something there that keeps you apart. And that person don't like you and you don't like that person and you're not sure what's going on. Just remember, they have a spirit in them that when they see the Holy Spirit of God in you and the living Word of God abiding in you, it immediately puts them in attack mode. And they want nothing to do with it. This stuff is real. Amen? This stuff is real. Now, turn to Mark chapter 5. This is a similar story. But I do not believe it's the same story with some changes made to it. I don't believe that. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. They came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. Different place. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man, one man, with an unclean spirit. Not two. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now this part is different than the one we just read in Matthew. Because this one man... They tried to bind him with iron chains. And the devil that was in him broke that iron chain, cast it asunder. Humans can't do that. I've watched, I've watched guys, when they get handcuffed on cops, they try, they're, they're drunk and they think they're Superman. And I've seen them try to use their muscles to break those hands. I'm going, that's stupid. They're not going to do it unless they have some devils in them that are giving them odd supernatural strength. Okay? I believe in that. I believe this Bible's right. Um, yeah, the chains have been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. Tame is a beast word. Verse 5. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones Does that sound familiar yet people yet people all over this country deliberately cutting themselves okay they're trying to identify what sort of psychosis this is i think it is spiritual in nature you remember the prophets of baal when they were trying to get Baal's attention to set the sacrifice on fire, what did they end up doing? Cutting themselves. So the blood, blood was everywhere from these guys. And here's this man possessed of devils, and he just cuts himself all over the place. Now look at verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. You see, the man was still there. But the devils had control. The soul of that man knew who Jesus was. And he wanted Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if some people who are tired of being controlled by devils could see Jesus in us and run to us and say, can you help me? That'd be awesome. Verse 7, he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son? Of see, this is the devil's talking now. Thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. 
What did he do? He just showed up. And it put those devils in torment. Remember Genesis 9. God put in the, into all of the beasts a fear of man. Man doesn't have to do anything except show up. Birds fly away from us. Squirrels run away. Deer run away. Any kind of wild beast in the woods, when they detect the presence of a human, they run. They're tormented by that. God put a fear in them. So move that up one level. Now we're in the, the realm of the spirits. And these devils are beasts. And all Jesus has to do is show up. And they cannot stand being in the presence of the Most High God. It's tormenting them. They have a fear of Him. And so, verse, um, let's see here. Verse 8, For He said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion. For we are many. How many is a legion? Anybody look at it? Can you look that up on your phone? Huh? 7,000? 1,000? I don't know. I'm asking you. It's not a trick question. Huh? John says 2,000. Okay? This man has 2,000 devils. Legion. Tor this guy... This guy doesn't sleep. This guy does not sleep. He's like a methamphetamine user without the drugs. He's got the spirits. 5,000? 5,000? Boy, we're fixing to have us a church split right here. The 5,000 are going to be on this side and the 2,000 be on this side and we're going to have to vote on it, see who's right. Yeah. Let's just say it was a th several thousand. But the idea is this man is tormented. He's tormented. Now, the question might be in your mind, how did this man get this many devils in him? It doesn't say here, but... If you go back, we're not going to do this tonight. If you go back and study Deuteronomy, is it Deuteronomy 18? Where God lists nine things that he told the Israelites, do not do these things. Wizardry, witchcraft, necromancy, um, enchantments, consulting with familiar spirits, passing your children through the fire. The idea is, is that when you dabble and start getting into occult things, playing with Ouija boards, tarot cards, astrology, learning witchcraft spells, things of that nature, when you start putting yourself in their world, you're basically just opening the door and saying to them, Come in. Come in. And take over. And these people who are possessed of devils, if they are never healed, they die in madness. Aleister Crowley, characterized as one of the most evil men in the entire world. A, a master warlock. Uh, he was, I mean, he was into all the secret societies. Masonry, Rosicrucianism, witchcraft, he was in all of it. And he died an utter madman. He was constantly trying to get in contact with higher up devils than the ones he had talked to. This guy was a bad, nasty human being. And here's the Beatles. I don't, I don't have a picture of it, but the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band album. They have a picture of the four Beatles, and behind them is a mosaic of different people in history that the Beatles say had an influence on their life, and Aleister Crowley's face is sticking right back there. They followed the teachings of this man. So when, 
when you dabble with things that God said, stay away from. God was being, God, listen, God was trying to save your life. Telling you, don't read these books. Don't play with these cards. Don't play this, this uh, Dungeons and Dragons game. Or anything like it. Don't play these things. Because you are inviting spirits to come in. And once they're there, they don't like to leave. They like to torment. So let me finish this out. Verse 10. And he besought him that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000. Could be. One devil per pig. And were choked in the sea. Now, again, you can see differences between Matthew 8 and Mark 5. I think the differences are there to show you that it is, in fact, two different occurrences. They sound a little bit similar, but there are differences between them. So, and I, I bring this out for two reasons. Number one, to show you the power that devils can have in a person's life. If a person is inhabited or possessed or oppressed, or he's just hanging out, he's got devils hanging out all around him. If that person, wherever that person goes in life, he is seeking power. And those devils will give it to him. Do you believe that some of the top artists in music, film, television, you name it. Do you believe that some of these people sold their souls to get that power? I believe it. I absolutely believe it. You listen to the testimonies of these rock and roll artists. They say, I'm just a normal person. But when I get out on stage, something's taken over me. And I can play things I've never played before. And I can hit notes that I've never sang before. And I have, a lot of times, no memory of what I did on that stage that night. Sasha Fierce. Does that name sound familiar? Who is it, Alicia? Beyonce. Multi-million dollar high-level star. Says that when she walks out on stage, she actually has a name. For the entity that takes over. And she calls her Sasha Fierce. And when Beyonce steps on the stage. You're not seeing Beyonce. You are seeing a devil or more than one devil. In her doing what she's doing on that stage. These people will tell. There's a story and I'm going to quit. Of a, of a black man years ago. Who at best was one of the worst guitar players you ever heard. But he wanted fame and he wanted money. And his own testimony was that he met the devil out on a road. And he said, devil, I'll give you my soul if you help me play this guitar. He had been missing for several months. And when he came back, he was doing things on a guitar. People were just going, that's amazing. And several rock and roll artists have studied. I can't remember this man's name, but they've studied this man. And learning from him and basing some of their music on his styling. I have no doubt whatsoever. Movie stars. TV stars. Comedians. Actors. Musicians. Ball players. Ball players. Selling themselves out for the abilities to do what no other man can do. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. Um... But the idea is, number one, these two stories are different stories. No mistakes. But number two, the possession is real. And the more you learn this Bible, the more you'll be able to spot it if you ever encounter it. Because I think more, more often than not, in this country, it's going to be subtle. Okay, Most people would never know it. But I know for a fact that there's people... All around us that are possessed with devils. And some of them may try to come to church. Okay? 
Don't be surprised. Because anything's possible. Let's stand to our feet.